Good evening, friends, and welcome again to the Pinnacle of Prophecy, where we are unlocking Revelation's mysteries. We want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. Of course, our local audience right here in Granite Bay, California, a very warm welcome to you. Just a couple of reminders. This is a series of lessons that go along with each presentation. If you do not have the lessons, you are able to order them, and you'll see a QR code on your screen. You can just scan the QR code and you'll be able to order all of the lessons. They now are available at the Amazing Facts website. And also for tonight, for tonight's lesson, you can just download a PDF of tonight's presentation at pinnacleofprophecy.com. But there are some other exciting resources that I want to tell you about. One of the new books that Amazing Facts has just recently produced is a verse-by-verse -verse study. It's a devotional on the book of Revelation. If you want to learn more about the book of Revelation, verse by verse, we have this great resource. And once again, for those of you who are watching, you can scan the QR code. That'll give you more information on how you can obtain one of these Revelation books for yourself. You will be blessed. It'll take you a whole year. You can read through it, take your time, study each of the verses, and it will be a great blessing. And then finally, we have a free offer that goes along with tonight's presentation. And this one is, who is the Antichrist? That's going along with our theme. We're talking about the beast power, Revelation chapter 14. If you'd like to receive this free resource, it's a digital download, you can just text the word Antichrist to the Antichrist 7 to the number 40544. And of course, you can scan that QR code that you see. If you're outside of North America, just visit pinnacleofprophecy.com. You'll be able to download a digital version of this. You'll be able to read and study along. It'll be helpful in your understanding of this very important Bible truth. Well, we have a theme song that we've been singing throughout this whole series. I'd like to invite a, a Javier to come. and Jackie's on the piano. And why don't you stand as we sing together? Words will be on the screen. Jesus, shine on me. Jesus, shine on me. Everywhere I go, when I follow fast, and if I listen slow, on bright mountains high, in dark valleys low, Jesus shine on me. Everywhere I go, Jesus shine on me. and slow on bright mountains high in dark valleys low Jesus shine on me everywhere I go Jesus shine on me everywhere I go let us pray Dear Father in heaven, we thank you again that we're able to open up your word and study this very important topic, Lord, found in the very heart of the book of Revelation. And Father, as we always do, we recognize our need of the Spirit to guide us as we study the Scriptures. So we invite your presence to be with us this evening. Be with those who are listening and watching wherever they might be. And lead us together into a clearer understanding of this wonderful, important Bible truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, well, please be seated. And again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And of course, we always like your Bible questions. And so it's that time where we're going to be answering some of your Bible questions. If you have a Bible question, we've got about two more programs after this. So you can still ask your Bible question. You'll see the uh, QR code on the screen. You can scan that with your phone, and that'll take you right to the place where you can type in your Bible question. But at this time, we'd like to Welcome Pastor Doug and Karen Batchelor, and they'll be doing the questions. Scott. I almost got hit by that, that oncoming microphone. Did you see that? <laughs> I almost got recreated right in front of your face. Good evening, friends. Good evening. Welcome to the Pinnacle of Prophecy program, and we're so thankful for the uh, faithful attendance of those of you here at the Hilltop Church. Uh, we're glad you're coming, hoping you're making some new friends as along the way, I want to welcome our friends who are watching on the various networks. In fact, uh, right behind, before we walk out, we've got a big TV monitor there, and we can see all the different channels. 
We see, you know, Hope Channel 3, BN, Good News, AFTV, and YouTube, and make sure that they're broadcast. It's kind of cool to see it going out all over the world. In fact, I think we have a few more people greeting us. I think we do have a few more pictures to, to share with you of people that are watching around the world. We have uh, Bahrain and Nigeria. Welcome. And we have a Zoom meeting that's meeting together, but they're from all over the United States and friends in New Mexico and Paris, California and Mills, Wyoming. Welcome. Portland, Oregon and Curacao. We've been to Curacao on our That's honeymoon. That's right, yeah. Uh, and help me there, Peru and California, Cuba. Sage, California. Welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us. And we know that there might be others who are still joining us, and they would like to have their pictures shared. Please feel free to share, send it to pop at amazingfacts.org, and we'll look forward to putting them on, on uh, the screen. Future program. Not that many future programs. Not We've got many. Two right. presentations left out of 14. Goes quickly when you're having fun, huh? Yeah, yeah. So All right. we got a lot of questions tonight. We do. Let's get going. When the disciples received the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues, did they speak those languages for the rest of their lives or just during that moment? That's a good question. Now you read, first of all, in uh, Mark chapter 16, Jesus told the apostles, you will speak with other tongues. Then we see the fulfillment of that on the day of Pentecost. God perfectly orchestrated this supernatural gift. There were devout Jews out of every nation under heaven in Jerusalem. They had come for the Pentecost pilgrimage. They might have lived in Spain or Italy or all over the Roman Empire. And they spoke the languages of those countries, but they also spoke Hebrew. And when they came and the Holy Spirit fell in Jerusalem upon those in the upper room, they came out and began to preach in the languages, in the native languages of these devout Jews. And they said, how is it that we, and it lists 16 different language groups, do hear them proclaim the wonderful works of God in our languages wherein we were born? They said, this is a miracle. How do they know suddenly how to speak these languages? And, you know, they came to believe in the Lord. Many were baptized. The gift of tongues even up through the time of Paul, 1 Corinthians 14, he writes about it. But it, it seems like it was for the purpose of launching the, uh, the Holy Spirit, launching the early church. Thomas went to India. He may have learned how to speak uh, Hindi or one of the languages there. Whether they could continue doing it or not, I don't know. But um, quick story. Really quick. I only knew enough Spanish to order at Taco Bell, even though I went to Spanish in school. I stopped in Deming, New Mexico and picked up a Mexican hitchhiker one very cold winter so I could visit with someone. He didn't speak any English. And I prayed and said, Lord, we're just driving along for two days to California. He's looking for work. And I said, I had work. I couldn't speak to him. And I said, Lord, I need the gift of tongue so I can talk to him. And all of a sudden, all these words began to come to me. I'd probably heard somewhere along the way, and little by little, I was able to piece together sentences and talk to him. When we arrived in California and I was talking with Omar, people said, Doug, I didn't know you spoke Spanish. I said, I didn't two days ago. <laughs> and you've got, right now our message is being translated by Carlos. And, uh, el comprendas, yo comprendo, hablo poco palabras de español. See? I speak a little no, bit of Spanish. No sé cómo That's the translation. Español. I don't know how to preach in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was a very small example of it. He lived with us, got baptized. Amen. And so, you know, God gives the gift for that purpose. Amen. On that note, what language will we speak in heaven? Klingon. I told uh, you already <laughs> about you keep asking that same question. No. The Spanish teach, people will tell you Spanish. I hope it's Spanish and not English. English makes no sense at all. It's going to be a new apply. language. Yeah, the language of Canaan, they call it. All right. Please explain Genesis 35, 18, where it says that Jacob's wife's soul was departing. And then um, Revelation 6, 9 and Revelation 20, verse 4. Well, I won't have time to look up all those, but basically it's talking about when Rachel is dying. She died in Bethlehem. And it says, as her soul was departing. 
And they're going back to the subject we had where we presented death. They might be wondering, now isn't that telling you that a soul went out of her? Well, that's just saying when a person dies, they cease to be a soul. Explain. All right, here, use your imagination. I got a little stack of boards, wooden boards, and I've got some nails here. And then I get my hammer, and I connect the boards and the nails, and I make a box. So I took these two things, and I create something that is a box. But then, for whatever reason, I decide I'm going to disassemble the box. I pound the boards out and pull out the nails. I set the boards here, and I put the nails there. Where did the box go? It stops being a box when you disconnect them. You with me? Mm -hmm. When Rachel died and the breath of life returned back to God, she ceased being a soul. That's why it says her soul has departed. She's dying. That's all that means. It doesn't mean a ghost flew out of her that was conscious and hovered around or went to Abraham's bosom. It just meant as she was dying. Have you seen someone die? Mm -hmm. That's what it's talking about. They cease to breathe. All right, and the Revelation ones. That's the souls under the altar. That's a little longer study, but it's clearly, it's talking about souls under the altar that are crying, saying, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? It's an illustration. Do you really think souls are under the altar crying in heaven? No. To save souls under the altar crying? No, it's talking about uh, the judgment of God is coming for those who have been persecuted. All right, Proverbs 31, verses 6 and 7 says, to give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Seems like that's advice to drink alcohol. Well, it's talking about those that are perishing. This is like someone dying. Did they give wine to Jesus on the cross as he was dying? Well, yeah, they did. They offered him sour wine, the Bible says, on a pole. He cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, and they thought he was calling for Elijah. And he said, I thirst. And then they brought him a sponge. They dipped in sour wine. They held it to his lips. He tasted it, realized it was alcoholic, and turned away. He would not drink it. Um, and they also offered him gall. The prophecy said, they gave me gall in my thirst. But that's talking about giving a medicine to someone who is dying. I would not use that as an argument in favor of drinking. I mean, let's face it, alcohol is a drug. It has a narcotic effect on people. And so is there anything wrong with using drugs m medically? In other words, you, there are certain strong drugs that have a medical value. The Bible doesn't speak against that. But we're talking about people who are drinking recreationally and they're, dis they're perishing. So no, it's Proverbs, same writer who said, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, this is Proverbs 22. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Mm. Woe to him that gives his neighbor drink. And, yeah. Well, this next question feeds off of that. And it says, I have a massive drinking problem. Will I die a sinner if I die while intoxicated, even after praying? I just cannot seem to stop. You know, that's heartbreaking because I think we all know that people are struggling with different addictions and alcohol is a, a tough addiction. Um, how many of you know someone that struggled as an alcoholic and got the victory and quit drinking? I hope whoever wrote that is watching. You can get the victory. I know a lot of people that stop for good and go to a treatment program, I would say. I, I, you, if you want me to say you can continue in an addiction and be saved, I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I'm not the judge. God knows what people struggle with. And it's not just alcohol. People are addicted to opioids and all kinds of things in our culture now, and God can break those chains and set you free. Don't Amen. doubt the power of God. Amen. But don't also refuse practical things. Go to a treatment program and uh, get clean, go through the shakes, get that over with, and then gain the spiritual strength. Amen. I have heard it said that it is legalistic to keep the commandments of God because we're saved by grace. Isn't it still God's will for us to be saved by grace? Well, grace is God's unmerited favor. And one of the ways that God gives us grace, he gives us grace to obey. Obedience is not legalism. The Bible is just filled with references. I could probably go for 20 minutes now quoting scripture after scripture after scripture where God says he wants us to obey him. What's the alternative? He wants us to disobey him. So if you're talking about obedience, now you may struggle with obedience, be honest, we all do, mm -hmm. but that's what God wants, amen? amen? They're not the 10 suggestions. 
They're not the ten recommendations. They're not the ten good ideas. These are the ten commandments. He wants us to obey him. And he says you will be blessed when you do. You can choose to obey or not obey. Do you know that you have control over how fast you drive? How many of you will make a public confession that you sometimes exceed the speed limit? Is it because of cruise control or is it your choice? If you are going 70 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone and you see a highway patrolman, how many of you slow down? <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. Is that legalism? You don't want the penalty. Is that right? Yes. What's the penalty for sin? Death. Death. Then do what you can do with God's help to obey. Amen? Amen. And, and when you love the Lord, you want to obey. Yeah, exactly. And when I see the policeman, I want to slow down. I don't want to, but I, I do. I, I need to. <laughs> We're still working on him. Yeah. Okay. This, this, she drives fast, too. <laughs> <laughs> this question kind of feeds off the other one. I might lose my job if I keep the Sabbath. Does God really want me to lose my job? Well, that's a practical question. People are saying, you know, we've learned the Sabbath truth, but if I go to my boss and say I'm not working on the holy day anymore, I might lose my job. What about my family? Shouldn't I love my family? And it is a tough test. But let's get to the bare bones of it. Are there going to be people in heaven that lost more than their jobs because they wanted to obey? Joseph was accosted by the wife of his master, Potiphar. We don't know what her name was. And he knew that if he refused her advances to sleep with her, that she was going to be scorned and be vindictive. Mm -hmm. And he might even end up in prison or dead. He said, how can I do this and sin against God? He went to prison because he would not disobey the seventh commandment. Did God ultimately bless him? Amen. And we're going to be talking tonight about others like... Uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah that went to the fiery furnace because they would not break God's commandments. The day's coming, friends, when you don't receive the mark of the beast, you're not just going to lose your job, can't buy or sell, and ultimately there will be a death decree. We need to be willing to make any sacrifice to obey God's commandments. Amen. The Sabbath is not less important than the other nine. That's right. They're God's commandments. So I know it's tough. Pray for God to supply Give him a chance to perform a miracle for you. Sometimes they'll go through a struggle, but I lost a really good job because I said I couldn't work Sabbath. God gave me a better job. Amen. Now, you might go through trials. I'm not saying it's always easy, but I've seen so many miracles. And uh, just give the Lord a chance. All right. My name is Vanessa, and I'm 10 years old. Elijah was taken to heaven by God. Is it possible to be taken to heaven by God now? Well, yes, but not before the second coming. I don't see anything in the Bible that says that God is going to uh, translate people before the second coming like he did with Enoch. The Bible says Enoch was not, he walked with God and he was not for God took him. Like Elijah, he went to heaven in a fiery chariot or some conveyance. Uh, I don't think the Lord is going to be doing that with people between now and the second coming. I think the next big translation, this is different from a resurrection, the next big translation is when Jesus comes and we are transformed and we are caught up to meet him in the air. Can God do that? Yes, it's coming soon. Hang on, Vanessa. Amen, Get ready. Amen. All right, our last question. Will we have free will in heaven? Oh, absolutely. This whole battle between good and evil has been over uh, free will and our ability to choose and to be motivated by love for God. So... All the sacrifice that is the suffering in our world and the suffering of Jesus has been to preserve the freedom for every intelligent being to choose to love God and or not to because God does not force us to love him. So yes, through eternity, we will all have that free will to choose. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think our question time is up. Question over. time is up. We still have a couple more opportunities to send in your questions if you want to send in questions. Once again, we're going to put that uh, QR code up on the screen. Scan that. Give it a second because some of the kind of TVs that we see in the back, it takes a moment. 
hold it up, adjust your focus. It'll bring up the website, and then you can uh, go to that site and send us your questions. But it's time once again, Pastor Ross, take a few moments for pinnacle perspective of some of the questions that have come in. Go a that little deeper. That is right, Pastor Doug. You know, we just finished up a great presentation last night about health. People often think health in the Bible, in Revelation, in prophecy, but it's there. It's pretty clear. Now, when one talks about the subject of health, one of the verses that people sometimes will mention, and maybe we should talk about this verse, this is in Romans chapter 14, and it's verse 2 and 3, and uh, I'll read it. I think they'll put the words up on the screen for us. It says, For one man believes that he might eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let, him, uh, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. So some say, well, is, this, is Paul talking about, you know, it doesn't really matter what you eat. You can eat whatever you want. If you want to be a vegetarian, that's great too, eating only vegetables. But uh, don't judge one another in what you eat. Yeah, first of all, the word pork or unclean food doesn't come anywhere in this passage. This passage has nothing to do with whether or not it's good to be a vegetarian or be a carnivore or eat pork or just eat only clean food. This verse has to do with a big issue that faced the New Testament Christians about whether or not they could eat things that had been sacrificed to idols. Now today when you go buy meat in the meat section, um, you're not worried that there's a butcher back at the slaughterhouse that has prayed and offered this to the devil before you bought it. In Bible times, all of the slaughterhouses had uh, deities. Whenever they killed an animal, even for food, they were offered to their local gods, and the Romans had lots of different gods. There were Greco-Roman gods everywhere. Many of the sensitive Jews said, how can we buy that food that has been offered to Roman gods? Are we participating in their idolatry? Paul said, look, if your faith is weak and you're worried about that, then don't eat. Don't judge those who do eat it. Well, first, let me give you a verse here. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and uh, let's look in verse 25. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, now these are not Jews, they're in Corinth. He says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord and its fullness thereof. Another place he says, it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Meaning if the word of God says it's clean and you've prayed and thanked God for it, then don't say, was it offered to an idol? Read down a little further. Go to verse 28. If you're invited to eat with somebody, he says, if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. He said, but you know, the idol is nothing. They're just statues. But if it's hurting their conscience, Paul says, don't do anything that's going to injure your brother's conscience. Is it pretty clear from what I'm reading here? The issue was eating things offered to idols had nothing to do with clean or unclean meat. The Jews and the Christians would only eat clean meat. So that was not the issue. But was the goat or the sheep or the chicken offered to Jupiter or Mercury? And they were afraid. And were, am I participating in idolatry by doing this? How many of you like Thai food? Do you eat at a Chinese restaurant? Any of you ever gone in and seen a Buddha? Did that keep you from eating? Some people I know, they're really sensitive and they say, they got a pagan idol here, I can't eat here. I say, all right, we'll go somewhere else. So that's kind of what they were dealing with back then, but the Jews were much more sensitive to the Roman sacrifice. Is that clear? That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 14. All right, thank you, Pastor Doug. Well, when you talk about the second coming of Christ, I, we mentioned that, we spoke about how Jesus is going to come. One of the questions that come up is, well, what happens right after Jesus comes? You know, do we stay on the earth after the second coming for a thousand years? Do we go to heaven? You know, Jesus said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. So where is that place? Matter of fact, let me just read here, if it's all right. We'll read just a few verses in Revelation 20. Because okay. that, that's really the passage that talks about the thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 1 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So here the Bible is talking about a thousand year period where the devil is bound in something called the bottomless pit. When does this happen? 
Well, at the second coming, that's when the Lord is, of course, going to resurrect the righteous, dead in Christ, rise first. You read a little further, Pastor Ross, there, and you see in verse 5, it says, The rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years are finished. Dead in Christ, rise first. Saved, rise first. Who are the rest of the dead? That'd be the wicked, right? You with me? So a thousand years later, the wicked are raised. But what direction do we go when Jesus comes? We are caught up, taking you to the mansions I prepared. We are not on the earth during that time. Satan is bound. The word bottomless pit is not the best translation. It's in the original, it's abusos. You've ever heard of the word the abyss? It means the emptiness, the void. It's describing the earth in a chaotic, dark uh, form. In fact, if you look in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. If I stop right there, what's he talking about? Sounds like Genesis 1, huh? It's not. Keep reading. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. How many men? No man. And all the birds of heaven had fled. No birds, no man. I beheld the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down. Is this the earth before creation or after destruction? All the cities are broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land will be desolate. So it's talking about when the Lord comes and the elements melt with fervent heat and the earth is uh, burn up and the sun goes dark and the moon goes dark and Satan and his angels are bound in this void. The word there is abusos. In the Greek Old Testament, it uses the same word. You remember when Jesus told the demons that were possessing this man, uh, he cast them out and they said, do not cast us out into the abusos. Exact same word as you find in Revelation chapter 20. Bottomless pit, abusos, the nothingness. When the devil has nobody to tempt and manipulate for a thousand years, it is, pardon me, but hell for him. And he has a thousand years to look at the results of his rebellion on this desolate planet. Um, Isaiah, I think it's 25, says, I will make the earth utterly empty. The left behind scenario never has the earth empty or void. It's only what we're teaching here that was the, the old teaching. Uh, we are taken away from the world. It's like 6,000 years here, 1,000 years with the Lord, 1,000 years Sabbath, and living and reigning over the unfallen pure worlds and being testi uh, giving testimony to God's goodness. We're not going to be reigning down here with glorified bodies over the wicked, and they are still sinning and killing each other and dying. It's just that would be such a, a confusing scenario to even imagine. I have no desire to reign over the lost and the wicked. Do you? That wouldn't be heaven for me. No, we are with Christ. And during that time, it says judgment is given to them in the same chapter. We're going to be looking at the books and seeing why people are there and why some people are missing. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Stephen, you know who Stephen is, he's going to get to heaven. He'll see the angels carrying Paul up and down the streets on their shoulders, a big parade. Stephen's going to say to the angels, uh, I think you guys made a mistake. Last time I saw him, he was killing Christians. What's he doing here? I say, I'll let us show you the books, and then they'll understand. Absolutely. All right, Pastor Doug. Well, you know, this whole series is all about studying the Word of God and encouraging people to study. And, of course, we have lessons that go along. But there is something we want to let our viewers know about. This is a new online Bible study course. We've mm -hmm. just finished it. It actually opens up in January, and it's called Amazing Shadows. And I know you had something to do with this because you wrote the bulk of the content of this online course. You want to tell us what this Amazing Shadows is all about? Yeah, I think it's 13 studies 13 that lessons. we go through the primary Old Testament characters and show how they are types of Christ. So we learn about Jesus by studying these Old Testament characters. And I think you'll find it a real blessing. That's right. And I think we've got a, a screen. You can see it up there. If you want to scan that QR code, It'll tell you how you can register for this online course called Amazing Shadows. And it's looking at Bible stories and how they relate or portray Jesus. So a great thing to take advantage of. We'll come right back with it.
Welcome back, friends, to our study for tonight. It is entitled The Beast of Blasphemy. It's lesson number 12. If you follow along with all of the lessons that we have so far for the series, if you do not have a copy of the lesson, we want to encourage you to go to pinnacleofprophecy.com and you'll be able to download for free tonight's lesson. Lesson number 12, The Beast of Blasphemy. Very important study. Well, before we get to our study this evening, we've really enjoyed the music that has been provided. Javier Gonzalez is going to be bringing us a wonderful song entitled The Love of God. And thank you, Jackie, for accompanying. Oh, 
Amen. Thank you, Javier and Jackie. Beautiful song. It's actually one of my favorites. I didn't uh, share this with anybody. My mother was a songwriter. She used to write for Elvis Presley, Frankie Avalon, Frank Sinatra, and different artists. And, and the lyrics in that song, especially that line, if we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, was every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry and the scroll could not contain the whole though spread from sky to sky. Beautiful lyrics. That's just beautiful. Welcome to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. So glad to see each of you here. And uh, uh, those who are joining us on television, we welcome you as well. And again, we invite you, those of you who are viewing from around the world, we'd love to have you take a picture of your group and send it to us, and we'll share that. Keeps the international family Bible study feel going. Tonight's lesson, cinch up your seatbelt, and tomorrow night, and Sabbath, Saturday morning, we'll be meeting here, and you'll want to come early, but uh, our program will technically start at about 11 o'clock. Um, we're going to be dealing with the beast, and the mark of the beast, and Babylon that are outlined in Revelation. Everything we've been giving you now is sort of foundation that leads up to that, and we want you to understand these things. Pray for me as I share, because I want to do this in the right spirit, but I want to be faithful to the Word. And as they say, I don't plan on pulling any punches, but uh, I want to do it gracefully. So our lesson tonight is dealing with the beast of blasphemy. That's lesson number 12. You know, we're going through our study guides uh, those of you who are watching, some tune in, and this is the first program they're seeing. If you go to the Pinnacle of Prophecy website, you'll find these study guides. You can download them and follow along. You'll notice in the presentations we're emphasizing certain scriptures. We want you to have the Bible uh, scriptures in your hands so you can remember these things and also share them with others. As I said, tomorrow night we're doing the mystery of Babylon, and then we're going to be talking about Satan's mark or God's seal, Sabbath morning, right here. All right, the beast of blasphemy tonight. I'll be talking fast. Please listen quickly. We'll begin with an amazing fact. Tallest statue in the world, it's fairly new, is in India right now. It's called the Statue of Unity, and it is 597 feet tall. That's just about twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty. It's of one of the great statesmen of India that helped unite the country, hence the, the name, the Statue of Unity. It cost over $400 million to build. It required 3,000 workers and 250 engineers to build it, and it took three and a half years, 1,260 days. That's just a coincidence, but I think it's interesting. And it's this massive statue that yeah, you can go in and up and around in India. It harkens back to another statue we're going to talk about that you find in the book of Daniel chapter 3. But before we go there, we are going through the, the whole pinnacle of prophecy is using chapter 14 of Revelation, the middle of Revelation as that pinnacle chapter that is a springboard to all the main themes you find in prophecy and indeed even the plan of salvation. That's a chapter that talks about the everlasting gospel, the reward of the righteous, the seal of God, and Babylon, the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the punishment of the wicked. It's got the whole thing in there. Giving glory to God, warning people to come out of Babylon, and now you have the third angel's message that you read here in Revelation chapter 14. And this is the verse, verses 9 and 10. Then a third angel followed them, saying... With a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself will also drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. It goes on to talk about the torment, but we studied that already another night. Probably one of the most fearful warnings in the Bible is here in this chapter given to those who worship the beast. Now, when we talk about the beast in the last days, um, people have all kinds of different ideas of what that might be. 
I remember when I became a Christian and I was younger, all my friends were saying, they got a big computer in Brussels, it's called The Beast, and it fills three stories, and they said that it's got the goods on everybody, and a lot of that, I think, was an urban myth, and right now you could probably fit that whole computer into your phone. So that was not The Beast. And then people said it was the barcode. And then I had some friends that they looked at the logo of Procter and Gamble. You ever look at that? And, you know, it's got these like six stars. And they said, if you draw a line between them, it comes to 666. I, I've heard all kinds of crazy things, but let's let the Bible interpret the Bible. You don't have to be wondering what is the beast. It is very clear. The reason this study is so important is because everybody thinks I wonder when the beast is going to get busy. Friends, the beast is here. He is already enthroned. And the devil has got the whole world, Christian world, distracted looking the wrong way when the real thing is happening right under their noses. And I'm going to prove it to you. Go to chapter 3 of Daniel. Hope you read the whole thing later, but I'll give you the quick overview. King Nebuchadnezzar II. They call him just Nebuchadnezzar because no one knows about the first he was one of the most powerful rulers during that golden era of Babylon. And he got the bright idea one day to unite the kingdom and make it eternal through common worship. And he made a statue of gold that was 60 cubits. Now that would be 90 feet. But in the Bible, when it gives numbers, use the number in the Bible. Don't try to convert it to English numbers or metric numbers. For instance, in Revelation, it talks about that the city was 12,000 furlongs. Notice the number 12 goes all through Revelation. 12 is the number to pay attention to. In Daniel chapter 3, it says it was 60 feet high, or 60 cubits, by 6 cubits. And I heard one Hebrew scholar tell me that in the Jewish reckoning, that if something was given height and width, if it does not add the depth, the depth would be the same as the width like the altar of incense was, I believe, two cubits by one cubit by one cubit. See what I'm saying? Which means that this statue was 60 by 6 by 6. Interesting. And then everybody's told to fall down and worship that statue, and those who do not worship the image would be killed. In order to understand Revelation, you need to know your Old Testament. And Daniel and Revelation are woven together uh, as almost, uh, you can't understand one without the other. So he gives the command, they play the Babylonian music, and everybody's supposed to bow down, and they unveil this image, and it's splendid, and their folks are just awestruck with all this gold, and they all bow down except for three Hebrews. Their names, Hebrew, was Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. We know them by their Babylonian names that are more fun to say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, we used to tell our kids the story, and we'd say, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed you go. But uh, they stood up when everybody else bowed down. They were not only at risk of losing their jobs, because they worked for Nebuchadnezzar, but they were going to lose their lives. Why could they not bow down? Because there was a commandment. The second commandment says, You shall not make unto you any graven image the likeness of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters under the earth, and you shall not bow down to them. And they said, No can do, king. He didn't want to lose them. They were some of the brightest guys in his government. And he said, Maybe you didn't hear what the consequences are. I'll give you another chance. We'll play the music again. You guys don't want to die. And one of them said, you don't need to play the music again. Our God that we serve, he's able to deliver us from your hand. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we're not going to serve your gods. Oh, the king was rabid when he heard that. He told them to fire up the furnace seven times hotter than it was designed to be heated. And if you don't think it was hot, it was so hot that the soldiers that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire were killed by the heat wafting out. They fell down bound in the midst of the fire, but the fire did not hurt them. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar rose up in astonishment and he said to his advisors, didn't we throw three guys in the fire? They said, that's true, king. He says, I'm looking in there and right now I see four. And they're loose and they're walking around. They're not tied up anymore and they don't seem to be harmed. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. 
Who came to them when they stood up in their fiery trials? You know, they read where Isaiah promised, when you go through the fire, I will be with you. And he was with them. And he called them out and he promoted them. God did through those Hebrews on the plains of Dur that day what he'd been trying to do through the Jewish nation for hundreds of years. They stood up for their God. They demonstrated the power of God. And the king made a decree that nobody speak against the God of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or they'd be destroyed. And instead of them being the victims, they were the victors that day. And instead of Nebuchadnezzar's God being glorified, you forget all about the image Jehovah's glorified. Why? Because they stood up when everyone else bowed down. Then you get to Revelation 13 and it tells us this beast power makes an image or the second beast makes an image to the first beast that had the wound by the sword that did live. And first they can't buy or sell. Ultimately there is a decree that they should all be killed if they do not worship the image of the beast. You hear the similar language between the two? There's going to be an issue about obedience. The beast power is going to compel people to obey a command that violates the command of God. It says that image of the beast, Revelation 13, 15, should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So with that backdrop, we're going to go into our study now to explain very clearly who the beast is. Now, when you read in Revelation 13, you've heard of the mark of the beast. Technically, in Revelation 13, how many beasts are there? Two. <laughs> People forget that. It's not just a beast. It talks about a second beast in verse 11 that rises up that tells people to worship the first beast that was wounded that came back to life. And so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you, and I'll tell you what I told you. <laughs> I believe that the first beast is the papacy, or what we would call the Roman Catholic Church. And I believe the second beast is the United States of America, ruled by let out by evangelical Protestants. I am a Protestant. I used to go to Catholic school. There are going to be Protestants and Catholics in heaven. We all listening? I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about prophecy, what it says. I'll leave the results with God. I don't want to say anything to unnecessarily offend, but I want to tell the truth. Tonight we're going to be talking about the first beast. Tomorrow night we're going to be talking about our country which I think is the second beast, and I'll prove it to you. Uh, you owe it to yourself to find that out. These prophecies that people are looking around, wondering when they're happening, they're happening under our nose right now. And even events in the Middle East and world affairs, I think, could be queuing things up for a grand finale. So you need to know what's coming. I, I need to take this from milk, and we're going to move into the meat. we got some heavy stuff, but i got to start with the basics. Question number one. Got your lessons? First question. What does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? What is a beast? It's not talking about, you know, Dracula roaming around or Godzilla in the last days. The beast represented nations. Notice what it says in Daniel 7, verse 17. These great beasts which are for, are what? For kingdoms. So these beasts represent either kings or their kingdoms. They are world powers. We're going to come to Daniel 7 in just a minute, but let me get through these these uh, scriptures here. The fourth beast, Daniel 7, 23, the fourth beast shall be the fourth what? What is a beast? A kingdom, a power. Might be a king, might be a kingdom, a nation. And then again, Daniel 8, 21, the male goat, which is a, a beast, it's a creature, is the kingdom of Greece. And so these different beasts that we talk about represent different earthly powers the beasts that are mentioned in Revelation are the nations and kingdoms that had a direct influence on God's people. It doesn't talk about every nation in the world. There are like 200 plus nations in the world right now, according to the United Nations. And it's really dealing with the, the nations in history that have impacted God's people. The nation of Israel was occupied by Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, then the divisions of the Roman Empire, and now the influence is global, and Christians are global as well. But it started out principally with the localized nation of Israel, the nations that occupied them, and then it began to spread around the world. Now, so if, you know, we, we still use this today where different beasts represent different countries. 
When you think of the American Eagle, what country? America! So that was a trick question. And the Russian bear, what country? Russia! And the dragon? See, I didn't tell you that time, but you got a China, right? The lion? England, right? Great Britain, uses, a few countries use the lion, but Great Britain is one of them. So it's, it's not unusual that different countries kind of have beasts as their logos. Little amazing fact, when America and our founding fathers were thinking about what their national logo would be, Benjamin Franklin thought it should be the turkey because it helped deliver the pilgrims. I'm so glad that he was wrong about that one. I can't imagine our soldiers going into battle with a big turkey on top of their standard. But anyway, so back to our question. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. I just want to uh, give you this background. Daniel chapter 7, and there's a vision here, and you really need to look at this quickly. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, verse 1, and visions of his head while on his bed, and he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven, north, south, east, west, were stirring up the great sea, being the Mediterranean. That was the sea that they knew about. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on its feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. This is Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar ultimately was converted and became a believer, given the heart of a man made in God's image. Suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, raised itself up on one side. This was the kingdom of Persia. Had three ribs in its mouth. Why one side? Because it was the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Persians were stronger. So it was kind of lopsided, you might say. Three ribs in its mouth because it destroyed three kingdoms when it came to power. Libya, Egypt. I forget the third one. Huh? Anyway, yeah, look it up. It's in your lesson. <laughs> and um, he said, Arise and devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, and it had four heads, and dominion was given to it. The kingdom of Greece Alexander ruled briefly, and then it was divided among his four generals. Leopard with wings, powerful and fast. It moved very rapidly. Now here's where we come to the beast. Beyond Greece, what kingdom came? Rome. And Rome then went through a metamorphosis. Rome went from iron to iron mixed with clay, which meant government and religion. Man was made from clay. After this I saw in the night visions, and before, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, huge iron teeth, and it was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. You get to Revelation, you get a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. It's an overlap between these two beasts. It says, and I noticed among the horns a little one coming up among them before three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. And then it takes you to a different scene and you can return now when the angel comes to help him understand this. And uh, you can go to verse 23. Thus the angel said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth. It becomes universal. You know what the word Catholic means? Universal. It will trample and break in pieces. The ten hordes are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom, and another will rise after them. And he'll be different from the first ones, and he will subdue three kings. And he'll speak pompous words, blasphemous words against the Most High, and will persecute the saints of the Most High. It's a persecuting power. And he will think to change times and laws. Only one of the Ten Commandments is both a time and a law. And it says that um, the saints will be given into his hand for a time, a times, and half a time. That is a year, a pair of years, or two, and half a year. That's total three and a half years. Then you go to Revelation, it talks about the beast power reigning 42 months. Guess how long 42 months is? Three and a half years. In a Jewish calendar, 30 days to a month, they're both 1,260 days. These are the same beast. God in the visions 
shows you something from different perspectives. As you walk around, he gives you different visions so nobody can misunderstand. But you're going to see the connection that this fourth power that is going to be a universal power is going to be persecuting. Okay, question number two. Who gives the beast, this final beast, its power and position? Answer, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, who is the dragon? Well, it says in Revelation 12 that that old serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan. So it's ultimately the devil, but he's not working through a kingdom. What kingdom? You can read in Revelation 12 that this dragon seeks to devour the man-child as soon as it's born. Jesus, what power tried to destroy Jesus as a baby? Remember, it says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, the angel said, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there till I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. King Herod was infuriated when the wise men did not tell him where the star directed them. They slipped out another way because an angel warned them, and he sent his soldiers into Bethlehem and killed all the male babies two years old and under because he was threatened. They said that this baby was going to be the king of the Jews, and that was Herod's title. He was called the king of the Jews. Now, Herod was a vassal for the Roman Empire. And so the devil then was working through Rome, not only when Jesus was a baby at his birth, but who was ruling the world at Jesus' death? Those were Roman soldiers that pierced his side and drove the nails into his hands. Yes, they were egged on by the religious leaders, but Rome was the ruling power. Rome, ruled by Caesars, is known as pagan Rome. And then Rome goes through a transition. Quick history lesson. For the first 100, 200 years of the church history, the devil fought Christianity with just out-and-out -out persecution. The Christians were fed to the lions in the Colosseum. They were persecuted. They went underground. They built the catacombs. We were just in Rome not long ago looking at the different catacombs this year. And um, terrible persecution. One emperor... He, not only Nero, who killed Peter and he killed Paul, but Diocletian and others, they were brutal in their efforts to exterminate Christianity and wipe out their holy scriptures. But the more they persecuted them, it's like one of the church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is seed. It's like trying to kill star thistle by mowing it. All you do is you scatter it and it grows better. And the more they tried to mow down the Christians, the more Christians popped up. Part of the reason is they'd see these Christians dying for their faith in the Colosseum with absolute peace. And they were seen. And all the pagans lived in fear. And they said, these guys have something. And they'd search out Christians. They'd ask about it. And the church just was spreading. So the devil went to plan number two. If he couldn't destroy the Christians with plan A of extermination and annihilation and genocide, he would destroy them with compromise. So instead of doing it from the outside, he said, I'm going to do it from the inside. I'm going to join them and then corrupt them. Along came a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine, who really, he was fighting other, you know, the barbarians were coming down and the Rome was having a civil war. And he said, why are we fighting Christians? They're not really violent. And his mother converted to Christianity. That helped. And so he legalized Christianity. In fact, he sort of overnight made it a state religion. He ordered his army of pagan Roman soldiers that worshipped all these idols and gods, marched through the Tiber River in Rome. He said, I'm going to conquer under the sign of the cross. I've had a vision, and you are all now Christians. Well, they had no instruction, so they went into the water, dry pagans, and they came up wet pagans with the name Christian. And they brought all the paganism into the church. So what happened in Rome now is you had a commingling of Greco-Roman religion in Christianity. It did not happen overnight. It happened between Constantine, 321 AD, and Justinian, about 200 years later. They had all these idols of Jupiter and Mercury and Apollos and Venus, and they said to the Christians, what do we do? We can't get rid of our idols. They said, well, uh, give them Christian names. So they called them Peter, James, John, and Mary. But doesn't the Bible say idolatry is a sin? Yeah. And the, the 
pastors, the Christian pastors, they used to dress like everybody else. And, you know, they would preach and uh, teach. And all of a sudden, the priest started to be a, a caste, a hierarchical system to be worshipped. And they took the Bibles away from the people and they said, you're too ignorant to understand that. We'll read it and then we'll tell you what it says. And they began to change the doctrines and commingle them. I told you about them commingling Greek mythology about the devil being in charge of hell. Where do you have the devil being in charge of hell? Or that he's, you know, got horns and red leotards and bat wings. And all this paganism came into the church. And it was the great compromise. And from that, instead of Rome pagan Rome, the iron monarchy of Rome, as Rome was crumbling as a government, the church of Rome was growing and the dragon gave its seat, power and authority to this final beast. We're going to show you that from history. So along came Justinian. Note the date you see here, 538 AD. Justinian elevated the papacy in power. He was a Roman emperor. He gave the military power to enforce compliance. Did Jesus ever say, believe me, or we're going to put you in jail or kill you? They began to force it as a state religion. And you can read here in History of the Christian Church, Vigilus ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Belisarius in 538 A.D. And all of a sudden it became a, a, a government, a religious political government that was sort of a mishmash of Christianity and paganism. Altogether. Now, there were many faithful people during that time that did their best to oppose the compromise. And you can read about Peter Waldo and the Waldensians, and, and many of them were driven by the state church into the hills. There were still faithful Christians. And you'll notice this time period keeps cropping up. Don't forget 538 AD. 1,260 days. A day is what in prophecy? A year. It calls it a time, a times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. It calls it 42 months. And that's it, the time period that's given more than any other in both um, Daniel and Revelation and other places in the Bible. It's a time of persecution. So this began a time where all of a sudden the church was elevated. A few more quotes from history. The Roman church pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire of which it was the actual continuation. The empire has not perished but only undergone a transformation. The pope who calls himself king in Pontifus Maximus is Caesar's successor. You know what the Caesar's name used to be? Pontifus Maximus. That is now also the name for the pope. We just, like I said, came back from Rome. You saw it everywhere. And so what happened now, it's like the popes began to take the place of Caesar's. Justinian and Constantine, they moved to Constantinople, where it gets its name, now today Istanbul. And basically they gave their seat, their power and authority to the papacy. It used to be the church was headquartered in Jerusalem. How did it move to Rome? You ever wonder that? When did that happen? It was a political move. So this is what happened. The throne of the, pa the, throne of the papacy, Vatican City, is the smallest country in the world today by size, it is a little kingdom encompassing 120 acres with 1.2 billion people that are scattered around the world. I don't know if you're aware, they've got their own postal system, they have their own currency, they've got their own army, it's called the Swiss Guard. They got a mini railroad, <laughs> a little bit, a little, Pope's got a little train that goes, goes around the papacy. And um, it's just an extra, they have their own banking system, it's the richest institution in the world when it comes to, do you know they own the property all around the, the world wherever the Catholic Church was established. They would get the best real estate. The church was in the middle of town and then the towns grew up around the squares where the church were. Go to South America, you'll see it everywhere. They own the prime real estate in many of the capitals of the world. And it comes to real estate and silver and priceless relics, they're extremely wealthy. I've seen it, friends, I've been in the churches around the world, beautiful properties, and uh, you know, they just survived uh, historic lawsuits. You've heard about the impropriety of some priests. The church has been able to pay off multi, multi million dollar lawsuits, and they still have money in the bank. So the Vatican, smallest country in the world. Do you know there are ambassadors from the United States? I think 180 countries in the world have uh, 
ambassadors that go to this little bitty country? They, they have so much power. Pope can address the United Nations. He's a pastor. You think they're going to let me address them? Probably not. But if you put in a good word, we'll see what we can do. I'd love to. What does the C symbolize? So it says this beast in Revelation 13. Wait, let's go quick, 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 quick. Go to Revelation 13. I'm jumping ahead and I didn't read this for you. This is our main. Of course, Revelation 13, no surprise, comes right before Revelation 14, which is a chapter we've been studying. And I want you to see the similarities between what we've just been reading here in Daniel and in um, Daniel chapter 7. Here we go. Then I stood upon the sand of the sea, Revelation 13, 1. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And his horns had ten crowns. So it tells you the, these crowns are obviously kingdoms, right? And on his heads are names of blasphemy. It said in Daniel, he spoke words against the Most High. Now the beast I saw was like a leopard. Did we just read about a leopard in Daniel 7? And his feet were like the feet of a bear. Did we read about a bear? And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Did we read about a lion? You notice what's happening? In Daniel, it goes lion, bear, leopard. Because he's looking forward. Now John is looking back and he does it in reverse. He goes leopard, bear, lion. Does that make sense? It says, And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. That's the fourth kingdom, Rome. That was written during the time that John was imprisoned by Rome. That's why it's present tense. And all the world marveled and they followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who's able to make war with him? And it was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. There you've got that 1,260 days. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. All right, so it's describing this power here that involved a great corruption and compromise of Christianity that was a ruling power. Now, if, if you look, there's a sequence happening here. You start with Daniel. You got Babylon. It rules about 70 years, but it's a golden empire. The next one is Medo-Persia. It's silver. We're talking about Daniel 2. It rules longer. Silver is less valuable, but it's harder. Then you go to bronze. That's the Greeks. It's less valuable than silver, but it's harder still than silver. It rules longer. Then you go to the empire of Rome. It's iron. Harder, stiller, harder still than bronze, but it rules longer, less valuable. Then you go to iron mixed with clay, <laughs> concrete, and it lasts even longer. The longest ruling persecuting power was the transformation of the Roman to the Roman Catholic power. Any of you ever play chess? What are the pieces on the right and the left of the king and the queen? The bishops. Why do you think that is? Because they had power over the kings and queens all through the dark ages. The pope would excommunicate a kingdom if they did not obey and the people would rebel against the king because the popes would say, you're not going to heaven until you tell a king to shape up. And the people would be terrified that they'd be burning in purgatory or, or not be able to get buried properly and they'd be lost and be in limbo or something and, and uh, there's just a lot of power there for how long? 538 is when he got that power to well if you add up 538, 1260 I'll let you do it in your head now I'll show it to you on the screen it says the waters that you saw where the harlot sits this is now Revelation 17 same power what is a woman in prophecy? So a harlot, is it a good church or a bad church? It's a church that has not been faithful. The harlot where the people sits are multitudes, nations, and tongues. Rome sprang up in the middle of the Roman Empire with a highly populated area. And Rome is actually, Italy is a peninsula. So it springs up right in the middle of that. 
It says, in her hand is a golden cup full of abominations. You know, one of the center arguments in um, the Protestant Reformation was the priests said that they had the power to turn the grape juice into the actual blood of Christ. And they had the power to turn the bread into the body of Christ. They said, no, it's just a symbol. They said, no, we've got the power. They said, you cannot create God. And there was a big argument over this golden cup they would use in the mass services. From the Catholic Encyclopedia, it says the chalice is the most important of the sacred vessels. This talks about the golden cup right there in Revelation 17. For how long did this beast power rule? Well, we just talked about it. It was given him power to continue for how long? 42 months. 30 days in a Jewish month comes to exactly 1,260 days. In a Bible prophecy, a day is a year. So you've got the starting point in 538. And if you do 42, that's 1,260 prophetic days or years. You've got a picture there of Napoleon. And Napoleon is crowning Josephine. You know, Napoleon, he was basically a Corsican corporal, worked his way up through his brilliance to become not only the general for France, but ultimately the emperor of much of Europe. He closed down, he shut down the Catholic Church in their power, and he only later gave them authority if they would recognize him as emperor. And it went from the church telling the kings what to do. When Napoleon came along, he said, no, no, we're not doing that anymore. He says, he put one of the popes in prison, he died there, he said, you're not going to be in control anymore because France went through atheism. They didn't really care what the church said at that point. And they lost their power. They received a deadly wound. It looked like they were over. So here's a graph. 538, Justinian. Suddenly the church gets military power. They become a political religious institution. 1,260 reaches to 1798. On that very date, Napoleon had his gen general Berthier go into Rome because a, a Frenchman was killed in Rome. They used that as an excuse to occupy the eternal city. Ultimately, they arrested the Pope. And they took him to Valence where he died in exile. That's exactly what, and they received a deadly wound at that time. What did the beast do during its 1,260 year time period? And it was given him a mouth speaking great things, great means proud things, and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Now, what is blasphemy? Oh, well, let me go on with uh, the rest of this. Power was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over what? Every tribe, tongue, and nation. You notice in Revelation it says the gospel is to go to every tribe, tongue, and nation, but the beast power is doing the same thing. God's got three angels that he's sending. The beast has got three unclean frogs. For everything you've got God doing, the devil's got a counterfeit. Have you noticed that? God's got a counter, the devil's got a counterfeit for love and for the Holy Spirit. You've got counterfeit Sabbaths. You've got a counterfeit for everything of the truth of God. It says, and they worship the beast, saying, who's like the beast and who is able to make war with him? Now, the Bible defines blasphemy two ways. Once they wanted to stone Jesus, and they said, he said, for what? And they said, for blasphemy because he claimed to forgive sins and also because Jesus said that he had the power of God. And they call that blasphemy. That's the Bible definition of blasphemy. Okay, does the papacy meet that definition? Let just read it to you from the Catholic Church's doctrinal manual. Does the priest truly forgive the sins or does he only declare that they are remitted? Answer, the priest does really and truly forgive the sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. Does the Bible say that man can forgive sins? The Bible says God and God only can forgive sin. Even when David sinned by killing Uriah and stealing Bathsheba, you know what David said in Psalm 51? Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Only God could forgive his sin. Now you step on my toe and say, I'm sorry, I'll say I forgive you. That's different. We're talking about sin here. So they meet the definition there, and do they put themselves in the position of God? I could give you a litany of quotes right here, but here's Pope Leo XIII. It's very clear. We, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Uh, that's pretty scary when you think about it. 
And let's face it, when Jesus walked the earth, did he drive around in a bulletproof Pope mobile? Or did he just walk the dusty roads with everybody else? He slept out in the fields. He was not living in a palace. Uh, things have changed, don't you think? When a man is worshipped as a god, then there's a problem. What happened to the beast after its 1,260-year reign? I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and the mortal wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. In 1798, Berthier, Napoleon's general, made his entrance into Rome. He abolished the papal government and established a secular one. They had lost their power that had been unending for 1,260 years exactly, just as it was foretold. But it says the deadly wound would heal. It's not over. It continued. When did it start to heal? Before World War II, Mussolini needed the support of the Catholic Church for fascism to succeed. And they said, you give us back our independent nation status in the Vatican and we'll support you. And then 1929, they signed that pact. It was called the Lateran Treaty. 1962, Second Vatican Council was looking to join or to build relationships between evangelicals and Catholicism, the restoration of unity. 1967, the Catholic Church launched its annual World Day of Peace. The wound has been healing, friends. The Vatican in, in the 20th century established diplomatic relations with 147 countries. As of 2022, there's only 13 countries left in the world that do not have ambassadors or diplomatic relations with the papacy. It is not just the church. It is a very powerful religious influence. The U.S. Supreme Court consists of a majority now of Catholics. For No Protestants are on the Supreme Court. Now, that's a misprint there. It says 2010. I think it's supposed to say 2020 up there. Do you realize that when America was founded, there were only Protestants on the Supreme Court? Now, there are no Protestants on the Supreme Court. Majority is Catholics. I think one Jew and one is he's kind of 50-50. And nothing against that. I don't think that should be a test. I just think it's interesting how things have shifted because America was founded by people fleeing the religious persecution in Europe and the, the uh, passion, the emotion was so strong the Pope sent a marble block when we were building the Washington Monument to try to help build relationship. Do you know what they did? They threw it in the Potomac River. They said, we don't want anything from the beast. That's America just saw the persecution. They remembered what happened during the, the uh, Inquisition and they said, no, no. For the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, an unprecedented joint statement was issued by Catholics and Lutherans promoting Christian unity. And they used the word, Pope Francis used the word, healing the wound between Catholics and Protestants. It says the beast received a wound by the sword. What is the sword? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Martin Luther and the Reformers preaching the Word caused a wound. Now the Protestant churches don't know the sword anymore and the wound is being healed. They don't know the Word. And let's just face it, friends. When 2015 Pope Francis came, he addressed a joint session of Congress speaking to all of the leaders of the United States. And you probably remember these pictures. There he is standing with President Obama before the Washington Monument, the Catholic Vatican flag flying next to the U.S. flag. And uh, can't we all just get along and unite? And then he went to the 9-11. He went to Philadelphia. He went to all the places where America had its seats of government. Do you know our first capital was New York City? He went there. Philadelphia. That's where the Constitution was signed. Washington, D.C. Went to all these places that were the history of power to try to heal the wound, and he was received like a superstar. Track, any of you remember that? It's not been that long ago. Yeah, things have changed. While the papacy is not presently dominating the world affairs as it once did by coercion, it's nonetheless one of the most influential powers on the earth today. Who besides the pope is recognized or revered by nearly the entire world and seen as, if you ask the people of the world who is the most visible spiritual leader, they say the Pope. Number seven, what is the beast's mysterious number? We all know that. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. 
six. I think it's funny. I went to a store and uh, I was checking out and the price came up to 666 and the cashier looked at it and went, ooh, look at that. I said, yeah, do you know what it means? No, but it's bad. <laughs> you know, some interesting facts about 666. You may not know that um, if you add up the numbers 1 through 36, it comes to 666. It's like the numbers on a roulette wheel. If you add up the first prime, the first six prime numbers squared in sequence comes to 666. And here's the one that's really interesting. If you add up the first six Roman numerals, you know, you get the I, V, X, L, D, I'm leaving one out, C, yeah, that's century, 100, comes to 666. It's very easy to do that in your head very quickly. So, what does this mean? Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. All right, so it's the title of a man. It's connected with a person. Confronted with the Pope, this is a book written by Pope John Paul II. Confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ. He is accepted as such by believers. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. The Pope. This is John Paul II. My dad met him. He takes that, the place. Who is the second person of the Godhead? The Son? And Jesus, the representative, is the Holy Spirit. For a man to put himself in that position is it's called blasphemy. He's a man. He says it's a title. Now I just read, he says his title is the vicar for the Son of God. The vicar for the Son of God in Latin is vicarious philae dei. What happens if you take the official title of the Pope, in Latin of course, and you translate that? In Roman numerals you all know I is one, V is five, so forth. What does that come to? Vicarious adds up to 112, Philae adds up to 53, and Dei, 501, total 666. You know, above the priest, he used to wear a miter, the high priest for Israel, said, holiness to the Lord. The ancient popes had a triple-tiered miter, and most of them don't wear it anymore, and some of them had a placard on it that said, vicarious Philae Dei. Added up at 666, that title. And it says that this is a power that has drifted from the Bible. Oh, I'm looking at the clock and I wish I could pray like Joshua, the sun would stand still because I'm running out of time. Let me see. What have I got next here? All right. So we've got 10 characteristics that we've looked at for the beast's power. It gets its power from the dragon. It fits that. Rises out of the sea. Fits that. Rules 42 months. Fits that. It's a blasphemy power. It fits that. It persecutes God's people. You all know about the Inquisition? It fits that. It becomes a worldwide power. The word Catholic means universal. It's a religious power receiving worship. Fits that. Receives a deadly wound that heals. That's happening. Has a mysterious number 666 and is led by a man whose name equals that number. And as I mentioned, the wound heals. What does this beast power want from you? All who dwell upon the earth will do what? It's wanting worship. What did the devil want Jesus to do? Worship. The battle between good and evil is over worship. Who will you worship? Do we worship a man? Satan is ultimately going to impersonate Christ. And I believe Protestants in North America, that's our subject tomorrow, don't miss it, are going to unite with the Catholics. It may be the rise of Islam that threatens them to do this. That's why world events now are very interesting. The Protestants and Catholics countries are going to have to pull together. It's not an accident that the Pope came and met with our world leaders and he's making trips to South America and the Philippines because they're losing control in Europe. Did you know that? Churches are closing in Europe. Mosques are being built. Number nine, what will happen to those who worship the beast? Then a third angel followed saying, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself will also drink the wrath, the wine of the wrath of God, 
that is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. God does not want you to be deceived, friends. He wants you to know what's happening. He wants you to know what's coming in these last days. What is your decision? Everybody's going to worship one or the other. What is the final message? Give glory to God and worship Him. The hour of His judgment is come. Friends, I want to read you something. This was not written by me. This was written by Protestant pastors. The Bible says do not bow down to statues. Catholic Church says you can do that. The Bible says everyone has sinned but Jesus. Catholic Church says Mary was sinless. The Bible says Jesus is the only mediator. The Catholic Church says that Mary is a co-mediator. The Bible teaches Christ was offered on the cross once for all. Catholic Church teaches that the priest does it every time he does Mass. The Bible says all Christians can be a nation of kings and priests. Catholic Church says that's a special caste within their church. The Bible says call no man father. You have one father. Catholic Church says to call the religious leaders father. The Bible teaches not to pray in re vain repetition. Catholic Church teaches repeat Hail Mary, our Father. The Bible says confess your sins to God. Catholic Church says you need to confess them to the priest for forgiveness. I could go on and on. There's no time to just show you that there was a great compromise that took place, friends. And we've got to make up our mind. Do we want to follow the Lord and the Lamb? Or do we want to follow the beast? The last days, how many choices? Mark of the beast, seal of God. Keep coming. We're going to talk about that. Don't miss tomorrow night. We're going to talk about the mystery of Babylon and what that means. How many of you want to be on the Lord's side and follow His word? Amen. Let me pray with you as we close. Loving Lord, we've been drinking through a fire hose. There's so much to learn and we're seeing that these prophecies have been fulfilled. Help us to be faithful and ready for what is coming right now. Lord, we know that you brought us and we're listening now because of you. And I just pray that you'll bless each person in Jesus' name. Amen.